what I like to do with my paintings. Start out realistically and then play with them. <laughs> And I had a wonderful teacher who was Clark Bailey. And he said, when I was ready to graduate, he said, I want you to go to San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. I said, what? Who, where? <laughs> My very first experience began in Mexico City. Elizabeth was 11, and her birthday was in, in February, so she was very soon 12, but 11 then. We flew to Mexico City and had to take a bus on up to San Miguel, which was, I don't know, 200 miles north, or it's halfway between Mexico City and the border. So, I'm in this big airport, Mexico City. My only Spanish is hola and adios. <laughs> and Elizabeth has a big green rabbit stuffed. And she's hanging on to it for dear life. And she has a tape recorder <clears throat> with all of her friends' goodbyes on it. Anyway, so we, we're standing there, no doubt, looking astounded. What do I do now? So this taxi driver came up who spoke perfect English and he was a guide and a taxi driver and he came up and said, do you need a taxi? And I said, yes, we do. Where to? And I said, the nearest bus station. And he said, you have tickets? You have reservations? And I said, reservations for a bus? You didn't need that in the States. I'd never heard of such a thing. No, we don't have reservations. Well, then you have to take a second class bus with chickens and animals and you don't want to do that. I'm not going to let you do that. And I said, okay, take us to the first class and I'll try to get reservations. He said, you will not be able to. It was four o'clock by then. And um, so he took me to one and they laughed. <laughs> so he said, no, I." Where can you stay in Mexico City? Do you know what hotel you want to stay at? No, I didn't plan to stay here. So he said, I will find you one. So this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Mexican taxi driver whose name I've forgotten stopped at three different hotels finding one that he thought was appropriate and suitable for us. He knew all of them, but he didn't know if they had air conditioning. We had our heavy winter coats when we left Oklahoma City. When we arrived in San Miguel, it was like 70 degrees. And he said, being American, you want air conditioning. And um, so we finally found a Hotel de Carlos, I think, something like that. So that was my very first experience in Mexico. And we stayed there three days. Elizabeth was crying the entire time. The only way I got her off of the bed and off of room service and out of the room after three days on a Sunday, I said, Beth, I've just learned there's a bullfight. It's less than three blocks from here. And do you want to go? Oh, yes, Mama. So she jumped out of bed, got dressed, and we went to see the bullfight. <laughs> and that was the third day, and then we got a first-class bus to San Miguel de Allende. Well, in the first place in San Miguel, your money would go farther. I don't remember what the exchange rate was then, but it was good. And uh, we didn't have a car. Uh, I walked everywhere in San Miguel, and Elizabeth did. And we were able to get her a, a school at Carretero, which was 40 miles away. So that poor child, <laughs> she was 12 then, uh, rode a bus for actually 80 miles a day, 40 going and 40 coming back. Um, but it was an American school called, and this is very appropriate for this this time, um, December the JFK's anniversary anyway. The school was the 
JFK School in Carretero, English speaking, actually bilingual. And so she loved it there. And um, um, I don't remember money being a problem. I do remember saying to someone after I finished or I was almost finished schooling there. And I said to one of my fellow students, members, I've done this all by myself. And he said, yeah, it was alimony. <laughs> So I am <clears throat> I'm grateful it was up, but I think I had $125 a month alimony and about 110 child support. And we made it fine for two years. My alimony was only good for two years. Mm -hmm. We made it. The temperature was moderate year round. So you didn't have, you just had your rent, which would be minimal. Uh, paintings, I did sell. This one, I remember an older couple from New York came in the uh, in the studio where I was having a in in class and that one was finished and they liked it and she said I would like to buy that one and I don't know what I sold it for probably fifty dollars and felt very 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 rich <laughs> I sold everything that I did there tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind this one that you call topaz this is a print of the original. Well, I, I don't, I can tell you the story about it. I don't know that there's any inspiration, but the man and why I put an American, Americanized cap on him, perhaps I knew a beggar who had that kind of cap. It wasn't a traditional Mexican hat, but he was a Mexican person and I just wanted him to embody all of the ones who had to beg for a living or did beg for a living. Many of them had to. And so the cup there is that. And the woman is just meant to be compassion. I think for a while I called it compassion or I called it topaz and I'm not sure which I ended up calling it in the long run. <laughs> but I hope it's I hope that it shows some compassion that we have had. The pathos I think comes not from him, but from the awareness of the observer. And so I have put in a second figure. I really didn't know why at the time, but as the figure developed it became a symbol of compassion, not mercy because there apparently is no mercy for such people. There is a compassion. Most of us feel it as a tangible thing as we approach and leave him. Mexico and all the world must feel a deep compassion for these people, for there is very little mercy. This first woodcut um, of an old man who was a model in one of my classes there. This class was wonderful because we could have so many live and wonderful models. <clears throat> and this woodcut was sketched from a painting done in the classroom. And I think it pleases me more than the painting, which was necessarily involved in getting a likeness. Whereas in the woodcut, I found more interesting, I was more interested in defining places, planes. Even so, I think the tranquility of the old man is here. He has retained a dignity in old age that undoubtedly would surprise us if we knew the indignities he must have suffered being a poor man in a land where only a few have money. These old people have retained a personal dignity that has nothing to do with outward conveniences, from money to baths. If they had to do with that, they did. And the woodcut of these three blind men, it astounded me. I was in a, I think it was in a bus station. I was in a public place. And I call this woodcut bound for glory because they walked as children do when making a train. I saw them walking in the park at Carretero, and the Woody Guthrie line came to me. This train and bound for glory, this train. 
Later, I saw them in the bus station, moving fluidly down the stairs to the men's room. One thinks their baths may be few and far between, but they had a dignity. These woodcuts, though hopefully some of the design has gone, some design has gone into them, are primarily subject material and the opposite, opposite of a painting such as a woman carrying a package. When I, when I write, I start with just an idea of what I want to say and then I just write it. And it's the same way when I start a painting. If I start a painting of Casey, I'm going to say, oh, well, there she is. And I'm going to start, but then I'm going to become interested, maybe in the shadows, in the shirt or a shadow in the jeans or the, and I just work as I go. That's how I paint. That's how I write, that's how I think. It seemed to me that this is a bride and this is a bridegroom and it's a wedding procession. At the same time, it is a funeral procession and she's carrying on her head a stillborn baby or an infant baby who died. Uh, this is fantasy. This is an illusion, but to me it tells the story of Mexico more graphically than anything else I could have painted. Um, it's, it has the wonder and the beauty and the glory and the sadness all in one, all in one. That's what it is to me. This street scene of people is the most meaningful to me in this series and carries this thesis title. It is a scene of the Mexican in his endless processionals it represents his religious, funeral, wedding, and fiesta professionals. The bride in her white wedding dress carries a wedding bouquet that has also become funeral flowers as she carries them on an infant's casket above her head. The father is usually the one to carry one in such a way, and it is a common sight to see the tiny family procession making its slow step by step march to the cemetery. The wedding dress is important to the Mexican and it's repeated in the white dress and veil of confirmation as though a visual offer of hope and future happiness. This is a poor photo and the painting is not available for another. But in the background are religious processional symbols, the figures of the saints of, and of Christ being born aloft in ornate settings. The bright colors, the soft velvets of the robes of the saints mingle with the sorrow of attitude and is the best way I know to present the bright somberness of Mexico. Contrasting words become one, as in a cockfight, in the hungry child wrapped in a soft red shawl. It's interesting how this, this book came into being. In, when I was working for my master's thesis and my master's degree, I had to present, I believe it was 26 paintings and write something about them and, um, and present that as part of my work for my master's degree. So I, this is in 1972, three, um, early part of 74. And I only had a Polaroid camera. I didn't have a computer. We didn't have any of those good things. I had a manual typewriter. And uh, so everything was typed out very poorly that you see in this book, a very pale ink, <laughs> very poorly. And the, and very poor photographs. So they were in a notebook and that is the way I presented them to, uh, to the school there. And they uh, accepted them, told me that it was absolutely wonderful and, and gave the book back, I suppose they copied, or this was a copy of what they kept. 
So I had put it back with my other scrapbooks and things and had never mentioned it to my children or anyone. It was out of my, I went straight to work. I forgot things. And one day, Casey was looking through some of my writings, I think, back in there, some of the books, and she came in here holding this book, uh, this old, old notebook, and she says, Mother, why didn't you tell me about this? And I said, you never ask. <laughs> no one ever asks. It's just lived back there in a dusty corner for 20 years or 40 years, however long it was. She said, oh, I want to take it because now she, would, she could, with her computer, copy the pictures, make them better. Not she didn't change, she didn't change a word in the book. It's, she was very faithful and very careful to be honest with all of that. I think there was one page at the beginning that I called a fly leaf and she omitted that. I think that was the only thing that was changed. And uh, so she took it and she scanned it into her computer and got beautiful readings of the pictures out of it. Got put the comments page by page and had the book published. Anyway, all of Mexico takes a siesta and I hope that they still do, I'm sure they did. And the Instituto would close down from um, 12 o'clock until 2 in the afternoons. Well, I was working in the back patio on my wood sculpture at that time and I don't take naps, never have taken naps. <laughs> and so I wanted to stay and work. And um, so I'm back there chiseling away on my wood and getting hot and sweaty and dirty. And finally, uh, probably about 1.30, I think, oh, I have got to go back to this hotel that was behind the Instituto, a very exclusive hotel. It, it catered to Europeans and Americans and Canadians. And so, of course, their English was good, but I didn't think about that. All I knew it was exclusive. We were not allowed to go back there. And I had been told by a good friend who stayed there, who had bought one of my paintings, that no one could eat in their restaurant unless they were staying at the hotel. Nevertheless, I'm very hungry, very thirsty. So I take my courage in my hand and I go back to the hotel and I knock on the door, this at a back door, and this maitre d' in his white coat comes, and lets me in, and he, I, he said, "Are you a guest here?" And I said, "No." And why he probably asked me in English, I understood enough Spanish that it may have been in Spanish. In any case, he asked me if I was a guest at the hotel, and I said, "No, I'm." in my very poor Spanish, said I'm a student at the Instituto. Pero yo tengo mucho hombres. And he burst out laughing and said in his perfect English, do you know what you just said? And I said, that I'm very hungry? He said, no, you said you have many men. <laughs> and he, he got such a laugh out of it that he asked me to wait there a moment and he went back to the kitchen and he brought me a thermos of some kind of, I don't remember what it was to drink, and a nice sandwich, and I took it back to my, to my sculpting. <laughs> but I, one, one more happy memory. I found the Mexican people to be so wonderful to me, beginning with that event in Mexico City where I didn't know where I was going or how I was going. I had a general idea I was going to San Miguel. I thought I was going by a bus and I had that wonderful, wonderful taxi driver that took us under his wing and he said, I'm going to see to it that you have a good hotel to stay in and you are going to have a first class bus to San Miguel and I will give you the name of an inn there that I know quite well and they will only take someone if they're recommended, but I will recommend you 
and he gave me a letter in Spanish to give to to this man. And um, I found the Mexican people to be so wonderful. And, and this was another instance of that. You know, come in, I will give you water, drink and food and have a good laugh with you. I was always treated that way. When people said, <clears throat> weren't you scared in Mexico? And your Spanish not good or hard? No, I was not scared. I found them to be wonderful, wonderful people. There were many bullfights in the out in the country, and they were practice bullfights where young torridors or old, but uh, they were practice bullfights. They were little country. Uh, as we would have a little rodeo here, not big rodeos. <clears throat> anyway, several friends were going to it. For some reason, I couldn't go when they went. <clears throat> then I went uh, an hour, two hours later. And I was going to meet them there at this old country bull ring. So I went out on, on the local bus, second class bus, and, and got there. And didn't really know how to get into this bull ring. So I walked around and I found a door and I went inside. And when I got inside, I'm in this bull ring and here are all of these people who came to watch the bull fight. And, and, um, and my friends were up there saying, Jean over here, Jean, hurry, run. <laughs> And so I hurried over and they reached over this, this wall and pulled me up. How I got up, I was more agile then, 45 years ago. <laughs> and I got up and just at that time, the bull came racing through <laughs> where I had been. <laughs> okay, so that time it was my friends who saved me. But the Mexicans again, were so wonderful that day because the friends that I was with, a couple of other friends, Tom somebody and I've forgotten the other person's name, and for some reason we wanted to stay longer than the group did that caught the bus and went back. And we said, oh well, we'll catch a ride, we'll catch a bus and go back later. We wanted to explore what I don't remember, but we did. And then when we got back, they said, oh no, the, the, the bus that, that we had planned on riding on, or the, the people, it was gone. There was nothing. It was very quiet all of a sudden. And there was a big um, a truck, flatbed truck, and it was just starting to pull out. So uh, we ran along the side, stop, stop. Stop, wait! And there was, you know, they spoke no English and we didn't speak much Spanish, but we said, we need to go back to San Miguel. Well, yes, they were going that way. Yes, we could hitch a ride on the back. So we rode back the 40 miles on the back of a flatbed truck. <laughs> they were Mexicans, they were wonderful to us. My experience always in Mexico. This is one of the last paintings I did for this series. This is oil, but it went very rapidly. I was walking home at noon from the post office and I saw a woman on the sidewalk pulling on her gloves and realized I had seen her often before, that her prototype was one of the first persons I met upon coming to San Miguel over a year ago and have met often since then. And this is true, one of her prototypes lived in that first, um, the first inn that I told you about. Now I can't come up with the Mexican word for the inn, but anyway, it was a private inn, very well respected. We were very fortunate to get in there for our first several weeks. And there were two or three women who lived there, this retirement age, and this is about them. They are grouped, not only on the periphery of San Miguel, but of life. They are confused, abandoned, and dying. They are retired school teachers 
who came or were sent by their children to live here many years ago because they could live on their retirement income. They have left one child behind in New York who tells them on twice a year phone calls that the climate in New York is bad for them and the cost of living is too high. And so they sit in their hotel rooms, 100 a month, room and board, or a guest house. And they go to the bank once a month, to church perhaps, but mostly they don't do anything. They tell you, if you let them, what Mexico was like when they came and why they hadn't seen their child for a few years. And when they go out, they are like this woman. Someone told her 60 years ago, Violet was pretty with her red hair. So she has the violet shawl and she touches up her hair and she puts thick powder onto her wrinkles. And then as the final talisman for being loved, being approved, by whom? By whom? She puts on her white gloves. I did the painting in a few hours of rapid broad strokes, emphasizing the white gloves and stretching the head past the top of the canvas for impact. And the subject becomes not a shadowy old woman, but instead the story of deception and isolation. If you wear white gloves and you are a lady, everything will be all right. Now, there were other women in San Miguel who were very happy, had their lives entertained, especially entertained on Thursdays when the bakeries made wonderful, wonderful dessert empanadas. And there was a, there was a rich, rich life for them if they were still healthy and young enough, strong enough to go to some of the cultural events. There, were, there was a, a wide um, non-Mexican speaking society there. But if you really didn't have the money, you lived in one of the pensions, that's the word I was trying to find for the end. You lived in the pension as some of these old women who were still in their minds and hearts and dress, still living in the 50s. Um, uh, the, these different groups. I didn't see the men, no. Women lived longer and perhaps went to San Miguel. And, and maybe the reason it almost brings tears to me because I would love to be retired in San Miguel now, but I would want to have enough money to live like one would want to live and not be confined to living in a pension that was very inexpensive but very proper and walking downtown to the Hardeen once a month or even once a week and pulling on my white gloves. And so this painting, this subject could have been very sentimentally and weakly presented. Some subjects are more in danger of that than others. Instead, I hope it is simply an honest statement of what it is. Children huddle together sleeping while they wait to be taken home. One sees them late at night, on weekends and holidays, while the parents cook on the street, under the, port under the portalises, or visit until midnight, and the children curl up with the nearest available dog or other children and wait. One more lesson in a series of painting for the Mexican, which helps shape their attitude of uncomplaining waiting. The bright town lights are around them and feet shuffle by, grown-ups talk, the children and dogs come closer together for warmth, softness, and sleep. You see them waiting everywhere and they wait monumentally without hurry. They wait for the bus, sitting by the roadside, in the bus stations, the park benches, doorways. For the future, for change, they wait. It seems to me not an unaware waiting, but a deliberately passive 
reading. The attitude of the mother in grief and compassion for her faceless children, but it is a grief and a compassion held in the pride of self-commitment, of self-containment. It is not a reaching out for pity or help. It, if it is an appeal, it is a mute one. This painting began in a realistic style and developed a cubistic feeling. This geometric approach and the black and white seem to add to the isolation of the figures. The children are faceless, the woman almost. This is an Indian Mexican. There are so many of them waiting in the pharmacia for medicine, for skin diseases, babies wrapped tightly in rebosas. They have little in common with the short-skirted Spanish Mexican who puts her sparkling-eyed children into her yellow Volkswagen and goes to the Bata for the day. This painting is of the ones who take the bus to, to Bata and then walk across the fields to their crumbling village. My tools and experience are still limited, but used as best I could to comment on life as I have observed it in Mexico. It is a comment and not a study. A study would take a lot of time. The worst was being in the bull ring just before the bull came in. <laughs> that was probably also the best I got out. <laughs> I think the experience that Beth had of going to the Kennedy School in Carretero was very good for her. And um, one of the paintings in the book, though, is a, a friend that she made of, of this girl whose mother was a witch. Elizabeth learned a lot of things that maybe if I had known before we went, maybe we wouldn't have gone. Because you wouldn't know if the experience was good, but it, it became part of her, and I think she was a lovely, wonderful person. And this came out in many ways. Um, this one friend I'm thinking about, her mother was a witch. There was a coven of witches. Uh, and they have, I, I think they call it a religion. This was a bright, uh, handsome couple and their daughter was beautiful. I believe they were from Canada. I believe they were Canadians. Uh, it was, I had never, realized that there were witches and they were proud of it <laughs> and uh, had their own thesis or faith that they lived by and so the painting I did of her friend of the little girl that was her age not a little girl they're 13 years old by then um, I wanted to, I was hoping it would show some of the confusion and some of the um, stress and some of the beauty perhaps of that kind of life. I don't know. She was a good friend of Elizabeth. Elizabeth had another good friend uh, whose name I can't remember. Her parents, they were from New York. Her parents did, the mother did beautiful, beautiful batik work. Uh, she did it through the Instituto, uh, but it was incredible and, and influenced me in many boutiques that I did later, especially after I came to teach at the School for the Deaf, and we did quite a bit of boutiques there, and it was a wonderful experience. Elizabeth was exposed to so many different English-speaking people there from all over the world besides her Mexican friends, and she learned to speak Spanish long before I did. But we were still in this little exclusive pension that, that we first went to in San Miguel, and we had only been there a couple of weeks. And she said, oh, Mother, it's easy to speak Spanish. It's easy. All you do is add an A or an O to the end of every word. <laughs> and so that worked for her. And uh, she, was pretty, 
she spoke. <laughs> she, she didn't ever have an interest in reading Spanish, and I read it, and but she spoke it very well. She communicated with her friends so very early. She, as I said, she cried three days in Mexico City in the hotel room. And, and my money is going away because it, the room for the ho money for the hotel room w would have kept us going in San Miguel for at least a month. And there was this go and she's crying and playing over and over her recorder of her friends. Elizabeth, we're going to miss you. Elizabeth, goodbye. Oh, Elizabeth. And they were crying and she'd sit in that bed and cry until I said, there's a, a bullfight down the street. Oh, all right, let's go. And from that moment on, uh, she was a half, half Mexican, I think. She was just there. She ate off the streets at the, where they're cooking tacos, whatever they're cooking on the street. You know, she ate it. Teresa, no. Me, yes. You, yes. Beth, no, not why. It just is perfectly good. It's wonderful. <laughs> and and so when we left Mexico two years later after I had finished this thesis, she cried. I don't want to go. You're always making me go. <laughs> no. <laughs> so she cried most of the way home. She was happy when we got to back to Chickasha. Uh, I, I, this is this popped into my mind when I think of her being happy. We had only been back to Chickasha. I still needed a few hours on my educational certificate degree. So we were back in Chickasha in, a, in an apartment this time so I could finish that. And we had a little car, I've forgotten what kind it was, but anyway, a car. And we wanted to go to a a drive in and get a hamburger or a coke or something and we're both in the front seat of course I'm driving and I've passed the drive my driving my my sense of directions always been very very poor and so we have passed the entrance to the drive-in so I said okay we'll just back in <laughs> so I started backing from the street into the drive-in to the to the window where you ordered well this Policeman pulled up <laughs> and 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 made a motion just to go on down to the street there where he could tell me I couldn't do that. And Beth and I were both we were laughing so hard that it made the policeman laugh. And he said, "I'm not going to give you a ticket. Just please don't do that anymore." <laughs> but we had such a good time.